All right, so let's start talking about respiratory assessment so that we can uh, know how to better care for these patients. So um, the respiratory system has multiple parts. You know, we can start with the upper airway. You know, we have our nose and our mouth where air goes in. We have the pharynx, which is the passageway. It's a lot of passageways and um, tubes that get us down to that area where gas exchange actually happens. Um, so then, you know, the powerhouse, of course, is going to be the lungs. Um, that's where our gas exchange happens. Our, um, you know, we take oxygen in and we get CO2 out. And, you know, we also have other parts um, like like the epiglottis, which help food to go to the right place, go down to the stomach instead of going into our lungs. So there's definitely a lot of players. Um, you know, we're going to talk about upper respiratory disorders where there's a problem in more the upper, the mouth, the nose. We're also going to talk about lower respiratory disorders that are more problems in the lungs. So there's two key principles in um, the, uh, you know, oxygen cycle, or not even oxygen cycle, the respiratory cycle, excuse me. Um, and there's oxygenation and ventilation. And the difference between the two is oxygenation is your ability to obtain or get oxygen in. And that's like, you know, when we put those finger probes on the patients, that's what that is all about. It is measuring, um, you know, how much oxygen is getting to the tissues. And that's going to be dependent on two factors. The first is going to be how much oxygen is around me. Is there actually oxygen for me to take in. And then the second factor is going to be, um, is there too much junk in that little, there's a little sack, sacks, a, a ton of them, not just one, there's a ton of sacks um, in the bottom of our lungs. And that's where gas exchange occurs. That's where oxygen goes in and carbon dioxide comes out. But if those things, those sacks are filled with a bunch of junk, then they're not going to be able to get oxygen through. So those are your two factors. So really when we're having an oxygen problem, think of an infection usually is an issue um, or what we, um, you're going to learn in complex about AR RDS, which is where those sacks fill up with a bunch of junk and then they get really stiff and they can't get oxygen in. A lot of the problems we're going to talk about this semester are going to be ventilation problems. And that's the ability to do gas exchange, so that inhalation and exhalation process. And so you should measure your ability to ventilate by your CO2 out. Now, as weird as this might sound, it's actually harder to exhale than it is to inhale. It takes more work for your body. Inhalation is a passive process. And that's a whole big, in, uh, you know, not engineering, but it's a, it's a very complicated process. And I'm not going to get into it because you don't need to understand that. But just understand this is that, um, you know, I can passively breathe in without a lot of effort. But if I have like COPD, and I've got a bunch of mucus in my um, in my lungs, and uh, it's going to be really hard to exhale, I'm actually not going to have that as much trouble breathing in, but I'm gonna have a lot of trouble getting that, um, you know, CO2 out. So that's really what we're talking about when we're talking about ventilation. And some of the other factors are going to be my compliance. So if my lungs are really stiff, they're not going to expand the same way, there's going to be too much resistance that they're going to have to overcome. So it's going to be harder to do that gas exchange. So you know, asthma, COPD, obesity, all of these can be um, can affect our ventilation. So this is kind of just a picture like I was talking about all that junk that can be in the lungs. If I'm full of fluid, if I'm full of bacteria, there's all this inflammation down in that oxygen carrying sac or the oxygen, sorry, the, um, the gas exchange sac, then I'm going to have a lot of problems getting, um, you know, oxygen in and CO2 out. So, um, you know, this is just to kind of visualize, you know, what that would look at. So uh, to kind of sum up oxygenation, ability to get oxygen in, ventilation is the ability to get CO2 out. So questions we might want to ask, smoking history, have you ever smoked? Um, what do you smoke? How much? When did you stop? Um, if they did stop, if they aren't, if they haven't stopped, are they interested in quitting? Um, do they ever feel short of breath? Do they have allergies, especially here in Texas? This is so important to ask. Frequent colds, um, you know, uh, coughing anything up. If they're coughing something up, what color is it? Is it a lot, a little? Is it thick? Is it thin? Um, you know, and then um, any previous respiratory disease or problems. And you also want to get a good heart history because lung disease and heart disease can be closely connected. They're really dependent upon each other. Uh, and then how does their breathing affect their day to day? So, you know, like with breathing problems, some people, I mean, all of us have breathing problems if we try to run five miles, you know, or at least most of us, maybe some of y'all are better shape. <laughs> you know, most of us at least get a little short of breath when we start running or doing activity. But, you know, when we start seeing some respiratory problems, it can affect our ability to eat, our ability to walk, to sleep. And that's what that last question is. How many pillows? Do they have to sit upright in order to breathe okay? Can they not even sleep laying down? Because that's going to tell us a lot about how their breathing is doing. But these are their questions. How much is their breathing and or whatever respiratory problem that they have affecting their day-to-day -day life? 
we have to look a lot for the respiratory system. We're gonna look in the nose and look in the mouth. We're looking for swelling, we're looking for drainage. We wanna know what color, how much, how thick it is. Um, you know, because that can show infection and things like that. And any blockages, is there a deviated septum, any weird structures, sores, um, any blockage for in the mouth, tonsils and things like that as well. And then we want to look for signs of oxygenation or lack thereof. Um, so like when I breathe, when I take a breath, both of my lungs, they, they expand equally on both sides. So I'm really looking to see is the patient, um, are their lungs both expanding equally on both sides? Because otherwise that could be a sign of a collapsed lung um, or a trauma or something that happened to one lung. We want to look for signs of um, poor oxygenation. And that's usually shown through clubbing over time. You know, those fingers, you see those nails on that bottom picture, those really show that like over time, the fingers aren't getting the oxygenation that they need and that's why the nails are growing that way. Um, and then cyanosis, you know, for patients with COPD, cyanosis can actually be considered a normal finding for them, but for most patients, if you're turning blue, it's not a good sign. We also want to look at the respiratory effort. Does, do they look like they're working hard to breathe? Are they using their muscles? And keep in mind, take a deep breath. <gasps> You know, where is it? You use it in your mouth, your, your face, your nose, your shoulders, your clavicles here. Um, what do you call it in your sternal area? You want to look at their abdomen. Are they using their belly to breathe? Um, so you're just looking how much work are they working hard? And sometimes you, you have to take their gown down and look at their chest because sometimes it doesn't look like they're working hard, but then you see they're getting what called retractions where it's like a sucking in of the um, skin, um, you know, because they're the bot the body's using all these extra muscles to help them breathe. Um, and then, you know, respiratory rate, the normal is 12 to 20, um, but you know, too low or too high can, is abnormal. We want to watch that. We also want to consider what's called AP di diameter, which is, um, you know, in patients with COPD, they can get what's called a barrel chest. So normally, you know, um, the, the distance from here is, uh, is different than the distance on the side. But for patients with COPD, they actually get what's called a one-to-one -one diameter, which means that their chest, um, you know, expands so much outward, it gets big and the air gets trapped because remember they have trouble exhaling that, you know, they're actually have equal um, with, and you can kind of see it in this picture, e equal distance side to side and front to back. And so that's something else to look for. Like we were talking about, breathing patterns are really important to note. So you don't have to memorize all these or know all these, but we really need to know, like we're always going to listen to a patient breathing. Are they breathing normal, like in, out, in, out, or is it, is it um, you know, rapid and deep, like we talk about um, with Kuzmal's rep, re respirations? Is it shallow? Um, is it intermittent? Are they breathing and stopping? These are the things we want to look for. And obviously, we definitely want to know if they're not breathing, which is known as apnea. Um, we also want to maybe look at their position. Are they in a tripod position, leaning forward, which helps to expand their lungs? Patients with COPD a lot of times get in this position if they're not feeling like they're breathing well. Or that pursed lip breathing where they breathe. It kind of looks like they're giving a kiss, but it's to help them exhale. So these are the things we're going to look for. And your body automatically does these. Like sometimes you don't even have to learn them. Your body automatically does them and finds these comfort positions a lot of times. We want to feel for the, um, uh, the chest wall expansion, make sure it's expanding equally. We're going to, if they, have, if they have any concern for like a collapsed lung, we want to feel and make sure there's not snap, crackle, pop, or sub Q air. Um, and then, you know, we really don't feel for tactile fremitus. That's where we kind of put our hands in them and then we have them say 99 and kind of feel the vibrations. We usually don't do that at our level as a nurse, but it's possible if you become an advanced practice, maybe so. We also want to listen for problems. Um, tell the patient to take slow, deep breaths. And, you know, I try not to ask them to take slow, deep breaths 15 times, you know, give them some breaks. See if you can hear without them taking a deep breath. But we usually have, usually we have to ask them to take a deep breath. Um, and then there's adventitious, we want to be, what are we listening for? We're listening for breath sounds. They should be clear. Now, uh, you know, I see a lot of students that put adventitious breath sounds is what the breath sounds are. And that's not, that's actually a general term for something's not normal. Um, it takes a while to know what you're hearing, but really like at this level, we just want you to know, hey, that's not normal. That's not clear. So really you're just trying to see, is it clear? Is it diminished? Which means it's really hard to hear. Um, some of the abnormal breath sounds that you might notice, there's crackles, um, coarse rails or ronchi, and all of these are fancy words for just saying there's something wet, like it sounds kind of like a washing machine, or um, a lot of times it's infection, but it really sounds, it literally sounds wet, it sounds like you hear water. And then there's wheezing or strider, which sounds kind of like, um, you know, it literally, um, you know, kind of, it's like, a, it's a high pitch, it's a higher pitch, and it sounds like, ooh, ooh. 
you know, it sounds like they're really struggling to get air in and out. And that's a sign of a narrow airway. So that's usually what we see in COPD and asthma. There's also diagnostic testing. Um, we want to you know, monitor their oxygen levels through a pulse ox. We might get an ABG to get their overall blood oxygen level because even if their probe is reading okay, it might not actually say how well their, their whole body is getting oxygen. Um, if there's infection, we may need to get cultures for TB. We may get the um, you know, TB testing and things like that. We can also get imaging through CT or MRI or a VQ scan and a VQ scan we'll talk, uh, you'll learn about in complex that helps to diagnose um, a pulmonary embolism. Um, there's lots of different lung procedures. We can get a bronchoscopy to like kind of diagnose or treat to see what's going on in the lungs. It's like a scope to go inside to look. We can do a biopsy to see if there's anything growing like cancer. We can remove fluid if there's fluid around the lungs with the thoracentesis. And then for a lot of our procedures like asthma and COPD, we're going to do pulmonary function testing or spirometry to see what's going on uh, what you call it, um, with their function, their ability to exhale um, and how air is moving in and out. All right, that is respiratory in a, uh, what do you call it, in a, uh, what do you call it, a beginner's, a beginner's look at it. So 